Merry Christmas. I want to know how many kids in the building brought one of your favorite toys that you opened up this morning. If you did, hold it up high. Any kids brought your toys? I see them. Some of you are sitting on them. Some of you saved some. This is one of my favorite toys from when I was a kid. Anybody remember what this guy's name is? Oh, they didn't just say Ninja Turtle. They said Donatello. They know which Ninja Turtle he was. This was one of my favorite gifts on Christmas. I was thinking back and just looking back at some of the stuff that I'd gotten, remembering Christmases, even this morning, and I was a big Ninja Turtles fan, and I remember this Christmas, and I remember getting this guy, and he's the old school guy. They have the new ones now, the new Ninja Turtles. You've seen them, uh, but I still remember that day. I still remember the Christmas, but now when I look at him, he's all scuffed up. <laughs> He's been through it. I threw this guy around the house and punched him, and he punched the doors and the walls and the other bad guys so many times. He's kind of lost his shine, hasn't he? And you know, I was thinking about how Christmas, as fun as it is, when we get these toys, when we get the things that we like, they start to lose their luster, their shine, their fun as the years go by. But here's what I'd like to encourage you with. Maybe you are one that would say, yep, this Christmas has kind of felt that way, honestly, and I came here just to get a little encouragement. Well, I want to encourage you with this. There's one gift. There is one gift that never loses its luster. It's not a Ninja Turtle. It's not that shiny new electronic that gets outdated in the next year that you have it. His name is Jesus. And we have that gift. You have that gift at your fingertips today. And I'm excited just to talk a little bit about just that. But before we do, let me do this. Kids, if you got your lights, and big kids, if you got your lights, get it out. Go on and flash it for me. Now I'm just doing that for all you parents that are worried that it's going to distract me in the sermon. Now you know. I'm good. They can flash away. It won't bother me one bit. But I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the genealogy of Jesus. So flip to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, if you will, I want to talk about what I'll call the untold Christmas story. Because I do think that this is something that goes untold at times when we tell the Christmas story, when we look at the Christmas story. And so you can look there with me. We're going to read the first six verses of Matthew chapter 1. Have you ever gotten to that place, let me ask you, where maybe the mayhem and the busyness, the frenzy of Christmas started to outweigh the real meaning, the real point of Christmas? Maybe you're there today, maybe you're not, but you will be one day. So what is the point of Christmas anyway? What is the point of Christmas? Why do we do what we do? We always say, well, it's about the birth of Jesus, but what does that really mean for us? What's the point of Christmas being about the birth of Jesus? I want to give you, I, every week I try to give you a bottom line. And so if you're taking notes, I encourage you to do that. If you're watching us online, I want to say welcome. If you're watching from home in your PJs, whatever that may look like today, and if you came here in your PJs, we welcome everybody and want to encourage you to take some notes. The bottom line today is simply this. Christmas is not about what I've done. It's all about what he did. Let's say that together. Christmas is not about what I've done. It's all about what he did. Good stuff. So I want us to look at a couple of things. I've got two platforms here. This one simply says what I've done. This one simply says what he did. Now, here's one thing that I know because I've been in church all of my life that religion tends to creep into the church and what we do in the church. And we start to stand on the platform of faith about what I can do. And some of you are here today and you would say, I've come because I need to check going to church for Christmas off my list for this year, so that it can be about what I've done, so that what I do hopefully can maybe somehow measure out, balance out, and be enough to reach God. Well, Christmas is not about what I've done. It's all about what he already did. That's what I want us to look at today, but I want to talk to one of two people today. You're either one of two people. I believe this in the room. You're either someone that's maybe caught up in religion and thinking that you can do enough to reach Jesus, to have a relationship with God, and church Faith, your platform of faith has become about what you can do. You're trying to measure up, and you're getting worn out, and you've fallen flat on your face. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever lived in this platform? You can say yes. It's all right. We're not judgmental here at Blackhawk. We've all been there. I've been there. So you're either that religious crowd that maybe you're just living in this world, standing on this platform of what I've done, or you're number two, you realize, and you realized a long time ago, that you certainly can't measure up, and so you don't even want anything to do with religion because you know you can't measure up. What I can do will never be enough. You've already gotten there, but here's what I want to do. I want to put us in the same box together. Are you ready? Guess what? No matter which one you're in, you're never going to be able to measure up to God's standards. This platform 
is not a good enough platform. In fact, let me tell you this about your platform of faith. I believe that your platform of faith, take write this down, think about this this week, your platform of faith will always determine and dictate your perspective in life. What platform of faith you choose is going to determine how you see the world around you, how you see yourself, the perspective that guides you in life. And so here's my agenda today. We're going to look at the genealogy of Jesus. It's kind of the untold Christmas story, if you will. It's the unconventional approach to telling the Christmas story. And while we do that, there's a couple of key reasons that Matthew would have, because here's the thing, we have four Gospels I love that we have four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. We have Matthew, we have Mark, we have Luke, we have John, and all offer these different perspectives, but they all were eyewitness accounts of the life and the ministry of Jesus. Two of those books, Matthew and Luke, tell the Christmas story. Luke started his version with what we typically read, which is Luke chapter 2. We read that usually this time of year. That would usually be what the pastor would get up and talk about maybe on a Christmas Day sermon. Well, not this one. I'm going to go to the Matthew account. Luke starts with the story account. Matthew starts with the boring old genealogy of Jesus. Why would he do that? What was he thinking? Well, I want to give you two for sure reasons that Matthew would have started his gospel and his Christmas story, his version of that, with the genealogy, the bloodline of Jesus. But then I want to tell you there's a third reason, and I'll get there in a minute. The two main reasons that he would have wanted to start His Christmas story with the genealogy of Jesus was because he's writing about the life of Jesus. And he's trying to convince a Jewish audience at the time. He's writing to a Jewish audience wanting to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. Because he knew, he stood, think about Matthew, he stood at the cross. He stood at the empty tomb. He knew he wanted to get there, but to start, he knew he was talking to a Jewish audience. So number one, he needed to show that Jesus came from the line of Abraham, that he was a son of Abraham, so that Jesus was Jewish, right? So that's number one. Number two, he needed to show that he also came from the line of David, because there's no way a Jew, maybe he's a Jew, but he can't be the Messiah unless he came. Because of the prophecies, and the Jews would have known this all too well, he can't be the Messiah, the Son of God. He can't be the one to save us from our sins unless he came from the line of David. And so when we look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, you'll see that he mentions both of those two things. We'll get there in a minute. And you say, well, that's all great, good education on Christmas Day, but that's kind of boring. <laughs> there's a more relevant reason. I think there's a third reason that Matthew started his account of Christmas and his account of Jesus with the genealogy of Jesus. And I think this third reason is the most important reason of all, and it's the most applicable reason in your life and in my life. And my agenda today is to explore that third reason. We're going to look at that. Why did Matthew do that? And while we do it, here's my goal. Here's my agenda. Some of you are living in this world, and you're basing your platform of faith off of what you can do, off of religion, because that's religion. We become self-righteous. You ever met a self-righteous person? Can I get an amen? We've all met one, probably all been one, just so you know, no amens there, right? (laughs) But if you're still living here, my agenda is to convince you to move over here. That Christmas, not just Christmas, but your platform of faith really can't be based on what you can do. It's got to be based on what he already did. So that's my agenda. No hidden agendas today. I've poured it all out there for you. Let's look at Matthew's reason, that third reason. Why would Matthew have started with this version. Your platform of faith will always determine your perspective in life, and so let's look at those platforms and what we can learn from this Christmas story. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Anybody ready for scripture this morning? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Here's those two reasons. The son of David, the son of Abraham. So he wanted to get that out of the way right off the bat. Let's cover those two reasons. Now let's see what his main reason might be. And here's the thing. You're going to notice a few things. Let me preface before we read it. Genealogies usually would just include the guys. It's not a sexist thing. It's just because it was the bloodline. We're trying to trace it back to David and to Abraham. So usually it's just going to say, he begat, he begat, he begat, he begat. And you know, you've read it. And you know what you do when you get here and you're reading through the Bible, whatever it might be. You read it and you just say, or maybe you've never read it and you, this is why, because I get to these kind of things, right? I hope you see some value even in that today. But when you do, it's almost like you just go, Okay, I read that. Now let's get to chapter 2 and see what really happened, right? But there's a few things. You won't see women in genealogies very much. There are four ladies that are mentioned here. Two of them are not even Jewish. Now that would be kind of a problem in some Jewish people's minds. It almost taints the bloodline of Jesus. It doesn't, but it almost does. So why would Matthew do that? Because he didn't have to. 
He does a few weird things here. Let's read together. Abraham, verse 2. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Underline that. Judah and his brothers. Do you know whose brother Judah was? We don't, there's a little bit in Scripture about Judah, but there's more in Scripture about his brother. His brother was Joseph. Joseph, the coat of many colors, Joseph. Now, already it's like, well, here's the thing. I didn't have to pick one of the brothers but if I'm Matthew and I'm going to pick one, I want to make Jesus look good, I'm probably going to pick Joseph. He's the one that fled sin. He's the one that all of Genesis, you see him mentioned throughout Genesis, so many chapters. But we're going to pick Judah. Why? Let's keep going. And Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Now, this is a family service. There are kids in the room. I'm not going to tell you Tamar's story because, yeah, you just need to read Tamar's story. It's quite an interesting story story. And Tamar would be one of the most R-rated type stories that you read about in Scripture. But Matthew's going out of his way to talk about Judah. He's going out of his way. He's going off script to bold, italicize, and underline people like Judah, people like Tamar. Go back and read her story. We won't do that right now. Then it keeps going. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amenadab. And Amenadab, isn't this good? You impressed? I know the names, aren't you? You wouldn't know if I didn't. <laughs> Amenadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. Now, don't say it out loud, family service, little ears in the room, but what was Rahab? She's known in Scripture as Rahab, the lady from the Old Testament. She shall be known today. But here, again, Why? Why are we highlighting this? What's Matthew doing? What's he thinking here? And Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth. Now there's a good one. We got to a good story. But here's the thing. Ruth wasn't Jewish either. Hmm. But he still includes her. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David the king. This is my favorite one. You ready? And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. He didn't even say her name. Now, in the Jewish audience, when he got to this point, and David was the father of Solomon by, they went, he's going to say that word, Bathsheba. We don't talk about that. And, it, and he, doesn't, he even says, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm not, watch this, I'm not even going to tell them her name. I'm going to make them fill in the blank and talk about Bathsheba. Because if you don't know the story of David, David had Uriah killed so that he could have his wife, who was Bathsheba, the one that doesn't even get mentioned here. Some versions I love even says, who had been the wife of Uriah. It's almost like Matthew's just poking and prodding here. What is he doing? And I love that he did. And some of this stood out to me in ways that it never has before in the genealogy of Jesus. Here's what I want to tell you about with this whole story. Matthew. Let's talk about Matthew. What was his third reason? I'm going to give it to you plain and simple. I think he wanted people to see the point of the story before he even told the story. He wanted people to see that those people, the most R-rated, crazy, sinful characters in the bloodline of Jesus, that they are why Christmas started to begin with, that they are why Jesus came. Why would that be important to Matthew? Let's talk about Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, we won't read it. I challenge you to read it this week. Matthew was called from a tax collector's table. Now, tax collectors were hated. I mean, hated in that time. You think you don't like the IRS? Try meeting one of these guys because they were appointed, so Matthew was one of them, by Rome to collect taxes, but they were set free to collect taxes. Ever, anybody ever gotten one of those surcharges? You know what I'm talking about? You get a surcharge for this. You, you pay for what you're getting, right? Then there's, oh yeah, but then there's this surcharge and this one and this one and this one, and then the surcharge is almost equal the amount of what you bought to begin with. Can I get an Amen. Well, it was even worse for Matthew because they were able to, as tax collectors, they were able to add any surcharge that they wanted to the taxes. As long as they paid Rome X amount, whatever that is due, they could add surcharges and charge extra. And what do you think they did with that? Stuffed it in their pocket. They were very wealthy, but they were hated people. In fact, in Scripture, if you read about tax collectors, it usually says tax collectors in this place were tax collectors and sinners. They were so bad they had their own category. Have you ever been in that category? 
so bad that you had your own category of sin and sinners? Well, that would be Matthew. And here's what I'll tell you. The people that he listed in this genealogy, they were him. Matthew knew that the point of the story, the point of Jesus coming to begin with, the point of his birth, of his death, and his resurrection were people just like Judah and his brothers, were people just like Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, David, who killed Uriah so he could have his wife Bathsheba, and people like Matthew. He identified with these people because he needed what he could do because he knew what he had done. Anybody in Matthew's boat today? You need what he can do because what you can do just doesn't ever measure up. That was the story of Matthew. And today, here's what I want to tell you. I love in Matthew's calling, when he said, Jesus walked up to him and said, come follow me, that Jesus goes on and he talks about verses 12 and 13. Jot that down. You can read it this week. Matthew 9, 12, and 13. What Jesus has to say in this story is, he says, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. And I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. I didn't come to call the self-righteous, maybe. Because if you're self-righteous, you don't need what I have. But here's what Jesus knew. Nobody is self-righteous enough to reach God. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. I came for those terrible people in the genealogy, in my bloodline. Here's what I love. Think about this statement. Jesus, yes, he came for sinners. He said that, Matthew 9, 12, and 13. I didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. He came for sinners, but I love this. Jesus didn't just come for sinners. Jesus came from sinners. Even in his bloodline, he came from the bloodline of sinners. And Matthew went out of his way to underline those sinners, those people who needed what he could do more than anybody else, just like him and just like you and just like me. He didn't just come for sinners, he came from sinners to show us how much he loves us, that he would leave the comfort of heaven and come here so that we could stand on the platform of what he did. Man, I need that. I don't know about you. I need what he can bring to the table. And here's what I'll tell you. The shady characters in Matthew 1, those shady characters, they're a part of the story because they're the point of the story. They're there because they're why Jesus came. But here's the most important part. You ready for this? You're a part of the story of Christmas because you are the point of the Christmas story. Look at somebody and say, you are the point. Tell them, you are the point. You are the point of the Christmas story. You are the point. Jesus was light coming into a world full of darkness. Jesus was light coming into a world of darkness. Jesus was life coming into a world full of death. Jesus was grace coming into a world of guilt. And it's all about what he did. It has nothing to do with what we bring to the table. Here's what I want to tell you as we wrap things up today. Most important thing you can remember, I think Christmas reminds us. Christmas reminds us that we can't judge the whole story by one scene. Think about when Jesus came through the process of birth, done in a barn, a stable. It smelled terrible. It didn't like the little, little church nativity scenes that we see. It was nasty. That was one scene of his life. He came in the most humble of ways, but you can't judge the whole story by that one scene. The same thing's true of us. Those people that maybe you judge their whole story because of one bad scene in their life, give them the grace that God's given to you this Christmas. Anybody got any family that might fit that? Don't answer that. We all have it. We all have friends. But here's what I want to tell you. This is where it hits home. God does not judge your whole story by one scene. Some of you have been judging your whole story by one scene, and you just can't move beyond this to get to this. You can't move beyond what I've done to get to what he did. But today, here's what I want to tell you. This is where it all lines up. This is where the whole point of Christmas gets nailed home to us, and it's simply this. Even though we can't judge, usually, a whole story by one scene, with one scene, Jesus can change your whole story. I think for some of you that scene is today. It's right here, and it's right now. It's not because you're in a building. It's not because of a pastor leading you in that moment, it's because God's doing a work in your heart. And in with one scene, Jesus wants to change your whole story this Christmas day. I'm going to ask you just to close your eyes for a minute. 
no matter where you are, whether you're at home watching us, whether you're sitting here, whether you're just searching and seeking it out right now, I don't know your story, but God does. And he wants to change it with one scene. In this moment, the point of Christmas is you. The point of Christmas is that Jesus wants you to move from the platform of what you've done to the platform of what he did, and you can be saved. What a great Christmas gift that would be. If you don't know Jesus today, then I want to give you a moment on this Christmas Day 2016 to just simply give your life to Jesus. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer because your heart's screaming that prayer, I believe, right now in this moment. But it's as simple as acknowledging, Jesus, I can't save myself. What I've done is not good enough. I need what you did for me. And what you did, I believe you died for me on that cross. I believe you're alive today. And Jesus, this life that's been mine is now yours. I lay it at your feet. That's the gospel. Yes, hear me, hear me. If you don't believe me, look at my eyes for a moment. Yes, it is that simple. Don't make it complicated anymore. Let Jesus have your life in this moment today. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I want to give you a moment just to cry out to him from your heart to his.